is that very section which the Constitutional Court found uh, had binding effect unless and until set aside by a court. We see the public protector suggesting that despite the language that she used, and we would stress despite identifying 182 1C as the source of the power, that if it had been a recommendation, uh, it might, she suggests, have passed constitutional muster. On that score, it is of importance, we submit, to note that the public protector does indeed enjoy powers of recommendation, for example, under the Public Protector Act. So, Section 64C2 of the Public Protector Act, as an example, empowers the Public Protector to make an appropriate recommendation regarding the redress of the prejudice. In Section 64B, she has the power, for example, to, uh, to refer matters to mediation, conciliation, or negotiation. I mention those powers precisely to contrast them with what she, in fact, did in this particular case. And she perhaps begrudgingly concedes that uh, the language that she employed is in mandatory form and purports to dictate the outcome of the remedial action. And not only does she use that language, but she actually goes so far as to prescribe the wording that the constitutional amendment should take. Let me move on to the facts. There are, for practical purposes, the Lord, no factual disputes at all. Uh, there are issues in which the public protector makes certain concessions. My learned friend has dealt with that. But on the, at the level of fact, there is very little, if any, dispute at all. Now, my learned friend has touched on the really catastrophic consequences that the publication of this report had on the day it was published. And the governor details in his affidavit the actual impact it had on the economy. In the evidence put up by uh, ABSA, there is an expert affidavit by Dr. Rebelli. And no issue is taken at all with the contents of his affidavit. Indeed, his, his affidavit is to be found at page 226. Uh, his curriculum vitae, which is attached to his affidavit, beginning at page 245, establishes him as undoubtedly an expert uh, in the field of economics. Uh, he has an international pedigree, and I stress, the public protector has not disputed either his expertise or indeed the contents of his affidavit at all. Um, Dr. Abedian refutes this notion that what occurred was really in the best interests of poor people in South Africa. And he deals with the impact of a threatened downgrade of our economy. And I wonder if I could take your lordship to what he says at page 238, at paragraphs 14.2 to 14.4. He says, the credit downgrade on a country to a junk grade status has ramifications for the entire nation, the rich and the poor. However, to the extent that the poor have a high degree of reliance on public services, they suffer more disproportionately. As mentioned above, nearly 17 million South African citizens receive monthly welfare payments of one kind or another. This has been a major public policy intervention since 1994 to, each, uh, to, to curb the plight of the poor. 
A major contributing factor that enabled the government to finance such large-scale redistribution was access to the global capital markets that facilitated the country's growth and rise of tax revenues, vastly improved fiscal management of public debt, cash management, and a host of other factors also made a contribution. The country's rising creditworthiness helped reduce the cost of capital for not only the government, but also for the South African private sector and the state-owned enterprises. A junk status downgrade will certainly materially limit the government's ability to maintain the redistributive interventions via the social welfare payments. Furthermore, to the extent that such a downgrade would lead to an inflationary economic environment, the poor will be further disadvantaged insofar as they will remain vulnerable to the adverse uh, redistributive impact of inflation. It is an empirical fact that inflation is the enemy of the poor simply because they have no means of protecting themselves against rising prices. Alongside the poor, the younger generation too stand to lose a great deal, primarily due to economic stagnation, lack of employment opportunities, and limited scope for up upward socio-economic mobility. Typically in such a milieu, the country ends up losing a great deal of young talent and skilled labor due to a brain drain. The medium-term consequences of the mismanagement of the prevailing crisis of creditworthiness is thus deep and wide. The Lord, I would ask your Lordship to bear what Dr. Rebellion has said in this regard when I briefly address you on the grounds of review, particularly in relation to the failure by the public protector to afford interested parties any right to be heard on this drastic measure that has had such deleterious consequences for the country. The Lord, the fact that the public protector consents to the order does not mean that your Lordship merely rubber stamps it. And it is to that topic which I will now briefly uh, refer. We have already drawn attention to the peremptory language of the Constitution and the fact that it is sourced, uh, that the remedial power is sourced in section 182.1c. That remedial action we submit really violates three interrelated principles. It violates the principle that Parliament enjoys plenary legislative powers, subject only to the Constitution itself. It violates the principle of separation of powers, which vests the legislative function in Parliament, subject to certain exceptions which are not presently relevant. And it violates the principle we submit that members of Parliament owe allegiance only to the Constitution and are entitled to vote in accordance with their conscience. Let me say something about each of those. One of the principles so clearly established by the new constitutional order, something which was in debate during the constitutional crisis in the 50s, when there was an attempt to disenfranchise so-called coloured voters is this, is that Parliament enjoys plenary legislative competence subject only to the constraints imposed by the Constitution itself. For present purposes, my Lord, those constraints are constraints relating to the manner and form in which legislation is introduced and, of course, fundamentally, to the Bill of Rights itself. I'm not suggesting that that list is exhaustive, but the simple proposition is this, is that no one, not the public protector, not the president, not anybody, can fetter Parliament's discretion in advance of its exercise. That is a most foundational and basic principle of constitutional law, which regrettably appears to have escaped the public protector. The second principle is the one which vests particular functions to Parliament in relation 
to the passing of legislation and stipulates the particular majorities which are required in order to achieve amendments to the Constitution. In this particular case, it requires a two-thirds majority, and once again, the remedial action on its face purports to bypass both the manner and form in which legislation is introduced and indeed how individual members of Parliament are meant to uh, vote on the particular issue. Um, perhaps an, a helpful case is the one we have referenced in our heads of argument, and that's the Executive Council of the Western Cape versus the President of the Republic. Your Lordship will recall what was at issue there. It was a provision in the Local Government's Transition Act which empowered the President um, to amend an Act of Parliament by proclamation. And the Constitutional Court said that is simply fundamentally inconsistent with the constitutional scheme. One cannot miss the power of legislation in the President and at the same time bypass the legislative functions of Parliament. And with respect, it is an axiomatic uh, analogy with the present case before your Lordship today. Uh, my Lord, that case was, of course, decided under the interim constitution, but it applies equally, if not more forcefully, under the final constitution as well. Section 44 of the constitution is one of the many sections which are violated uh, by the public protector's remedial action. But could I merely draw attention to this? Section 44, 1, a3 says this. It says the national legislative authority as vested in Parliament confers on the National Assembly the power uh, in the first instance to amend the Constitution and then in subsection 3 is to assign any of its legislative powers except the power to amend the Constitution. And we know, and it is admitted uh, has to be admitted by the public protector, that the Constitution makes it absolutely clear that the public protector, like all Chapter 9 institutions, is subject to the Constitution and the law. Yet, on its face, this remedial action purports to bypass Section 44 of the Constitution. Lastly on the score is the question of the role of individual members of Parliament. And that, as your Lordship probably knows, was the subject of the so-called secret ballot case. We reference it uh, in our heads of argument. It's United Democratic Front, Front versus Speaker of the National Assembly. It was handed down on the 22nd of June 2017. But Lord, it's only necessary for me to refer your Lordship to what the court said, it says this similar thing to many places, but it's captured nicely in paragraph 83 of the judgment where the court said this, each member must, that's each member of parliament, each member must, depending on the grounds and circumstances of the motion, be able to do what would in reality advance our constitutional project of improving the lives of all citizens freeing their potential and generally ensuring accountability for the way things are done in their name and purportedly for their benefit. Now, on its face, the public protection of action strips individual members of the parliament of their duties and fidelity to their oaths of office. Let me touch on the Audi point because it is of some importance, particularly if regard is had to the catastrophic consequences of the public protector's failure to hear anybody on the question of this amendment to the uh, mandate of the Reserve Bank. The point is squarely taken by both the Governor of the Reserve Bank and by ABSA, I merely give your Lordship the reference 
to Absa's affidavit at page 220 to 221 at paragraphs 3.5 to 3.8. Now, there does not appear to be any dispute that the public protector is under a duty to act fairly and that it is the essence of fairness that those affected uh, are given the right to be heard. The way the public protector does this in practice is she issues a, a provisional report. She calls it a provisional report for good reason because it is that report which is given to interested and affected parties and she invites comment. There is not the slightest indication in the provisional report that the public protector was ever contemplating as radical and far-reaching remedial action as directing an amendment to the Constitution, with the result that nobody was heard on the issue and on its publication it had this massively deleterious impact on the economy. And the Lord, as we well know, once there is a right to be heard, it is of course no answer to say that a hearing would have made no difference. But one can only but imagine if the public protector had indeed afforded interested parties uh, a right to be heard, like the governor of the Reserve Bank, like genuine experts in the field, like Dr. Rebellion, that these disastrous consequences may well have been averted, but they were not. That is in and of itself an independent ground of review, and on that score, the Lord, there is no dispute of fact. Can I then turn, the Lord, to the question of the procedure that ABSA followed? It's a very simple uh, situation which arose that ABSA, quite rightly, was cited as a respondent in the proceedings because it had a direct and substantial interest in the matter. ABSA, however, supported the relief sought by the Reserve Bank and therefore uh, applied to be regarded as a co-applicant uh, in the application. It did so virtually within two days of receipt of the application from the Reserve Bank and it did so in time for any, uh, any party who wished to oppose to do so in accordance with the urgent timetable which had been laid down by the Reserve Bank. It immediately wrote to all the parties, including the public protector, telling it that this is what it wished to do. It advised the parties that it supported the relief sought by the Reserve Bank, that it would file an affidavit in support of such relief, and it also indicated in the letter, and this is attached to its papers, that it wished to be regarded as a co-applicant, and it filed its affidavit, in fact, within three days of receipt of the Reserve Bank's application. Now, the Lord, the simple proposition is this. The rules of court simply don't cater for the situation. We have submitted, we did so in the affidavit and in the heads of argument, that this is an obvious matter for the exercise of your Lordship's inherent jurisdiction. And there are a whole range of obvious advantages uh, in the procedure adopted, not the least of which is that it affords all parties uh, their uh, appropriate opportunities to oppose it. Uh, it doesn't, as it were, steal any procedural advantage on anyone. Everybody has the equal opportunity to have their say in the matter. And perhaps most importantly, my Lord, it avoids the need for parallel litigation. To have required the, the to absent in these circumstances, to have instituted a separate application, uh, would have resulted in inevitable duplication. The public protector's provisional report would have been annexed. The final report would have been annexed. It would have been simply an unnecessary and wasteful duplication. So, my Lord, we submit that the procedure adopted 
was perfectly competent in terms of your Lordship's powers, and most critically, although the, reserve, and although the public protector suggests uh, in her affidavit that the procedure is irregular, there is the most significant omission. There is not the slightest suggestion that the public protector or indeed anybody else has suffered any prejudice, and there of course couldn't be uh, any such allegation. The Lord, those then are our submissions. Oh, I should say something about costs. Uh, we have made it clear to the public protector that we do not seek an order of costs, and that remains uh, our position. My Lord, the Lordship would have realized that we make common cause with applicants. And equally, we would wish to be regarded as co applicants in the matter. I have conferred with my letter colleague whether or not they have any particular attitude to that uh, stance we take, and I'm reliably informed that they have no objection that they be so admitted. Your Lordship will see that the arguments which are made on behalf of the second and third respondent are postulated in the answering affidavit that was filed on their behalf. And if I invite your, your Lordship, we deal with paragraph 7.2 of the remedial action to which our target of the address is aimed. We cite the Remedial action in its own language at the top of page 301, and we deal with the meaning of that order. The submission we made there is the following: order, that the pump protector ordered the chair of the portfolio committee and open code must initiate a process that will result in the amendment of section 224 of the constitution. You say that. This order is unambiguous. It says that the chair of the portfolio committee must, and uses the word must as a parameter word, <clears throat> to initiate a process that will result in the amendment of section 224 of the constitution. It goes on to prescribe how that amendment should thus read, and to submit that that order in relation to section 224 of the constitution be amended and not merely an order that a motion for its amendment be introduced in parliament. <clears throat> and to deal further in paragraph eight with the effect of the amendment as we see it, we cite section 224 of the constitution which reads as follows. One, the primary object of the South African Reserve Bank is to protect the value of the currency in the interest of balance and sustainable economic growth in the Republic. Sub so, two, the South African Reserve Bank, in pursuit of its primary object, must perform its functions independently and without fear, favor, or prejudice. But there must be regular consultation between the bank and the cabinet member responsible for national financial matters. The effect of this, we say, and we say that against paragraph nine of uh, the affidavit would be as follows.